Well, hello, friends. It's Friday. I know that day just resonates in your ears. Congratulations. It's been a long week. Maybe, uh, maybe it's been a great week. Either way, this kind of marks the end of the work week for most of us, and you're looking forward to the weekend. So let's get into the weekend with an exciting experience with Peter and John. I'm coming from Acts chapter 3. I've got a lot of text I want to look at in terms of application, but let's read to get into the storyline, verses 11 through 16. So while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, Fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life, whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this, by faith in His name. His name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect help in front of all of you. All right, to say Peter's not pulling any punches is an understatement. And it just shows how bold he is now. You know, he was confronted by a servant girl on the, the morning, the early morning time of the uh, trial of Jesus, and he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And so now we fast forward, the Holy Spirit's come, Peter's seen the risen, well, I guess in order, Peter's seen the risen Christ, he's been restored, John 21, the Holy Spirit came, Acts 2, and now here in Acts 3, we see Peter as bold as ever, not for his own um, for, you know, uh, building up and promotion, but for the name of Christ. And we see that he goes right to the heart of the matter. He says, Jesus, the promised one, you murdered him. You handed him over. You are the ones who are guilty as charged because it's only in his name that this miracle has taken place. But what I notice here is that everything Peter's doing, uh, whether it's confronting them in their sin or whether it's confirming how the man was healed, Every bit of it is directing their attention back to Jesus. Let's not forget, we're only about, you know, well, we're probably, what, two, three, maybe four months out from uh, the time that Jesus was crucified. And so the name Jesus is still fresh on them. The, the whole experience of him coming in on Monday and them screaming Hosanna and then coming Friday, them screaming crucify, all that's still fresh on them. And Peter says, hey, oh, remember that guy? Yeah, uh-huh, you hand him over. He's the promised one. It is through faith in his name that this man has been healed. It's nothing of me or John. It is all of Jesus. Now pick back up with the storyline. Because Peter doesn't leave them in the shame of their guilt. And that's what he says. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had pre predicted through all the prophets, that is, his Messiah would suffer. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Wow, what a phenomenal charge and um, uh, direction of application here. He says, repent. Number one, what you did was to fulfill God's plan. Basically, it was God's will that his Messiah would suffer. So therefore, repent of your actions. So he's basically saying, even though you fulfill God's plan, you're not off the hook. You're not innocent of charges. You are guilty. But repent, he says, and turn back. Which is interesting because that's almost captured within the word repent. To repent means to have a genuine sorrow. God, you know, a, a, a heartfelt sorrow for a, an act committed against God in this case. And a determination to turn away from and go in the other direction. Turn back so your sins may be wiped out. Number one, you might have forgiveness of sin. Number two, seasons of refreshing may come. The whole idea of the peace of God coming into their life. Number three, that he may send Jesus who was appointed for you as Messiah. That's fascinating. That lets me know that Peter's motive in being so uh, intentional with the gospel and, and, and so invigorated for the gospel was not simply just to fulfill his commission, although that was important. He had been commissioned to be a witness because he says early on, hey, we're witnesses of these things. But he also knows that in order for Christ to return, this message of the gospel must be preached to all the nations. And that's what compelled Peter, John, the other apostles. That's what compelled the apostle Paul. 
That's what compelled the other missionaries that were spawned out of that initial movement of the church. And that's what continues to compel many today is the ex expectation of what Jesus said. Jesus said when this message of the gospel is preached to all the world, it's got to be preached to all the world, then be alert, be, be, uh, be looking. The end is coming. And you can tell from his words, he was expecting that. He fully believed that by his faithfulness in presenting the gospel, and by his faithfulness in proclaiming that gospel throughout wherever God would send him, that that would then usher in the return of Christ. And maybe that's what we're missing in, in our, our commission these days. Maybe we're, we're forgetting that being intentional with the gospel and, and being you know, uh, empowered by the Spirit, being uh, committed to our commission, all of that should compel us toward the expectation that, or should be compelled by the expectation that Jesus will return once the gospel has been presented to all the nations. And we still got a long way to go, according to missiologists. However, we are close. And the ability to understand languages and get the gospel into those languages, we're getting better and better at it with technology and with more and more people being, you know, feeling the call to go to the unreached people groups. You know, we're slowly identifying and we're slowly and methodically getting the gospel into the ear of them. And that goes true for us as well. Just because we're in an area that's, you know, Christianized doesn't mean that everybody has heard the gospel correctly, had the opportunity, you know, and been instructed in how to respond to that gospel, you know, and, and told about grace through faith salvation. Hey, we have a work to be done as well. So let us be compelled, my brothers and sisters, by our commission to go and make disciples. And let's also be compelled by the expectation that in fulfilling that commission, we're helping to usher in that final messianic age where Christ will return in his glory and he will rule and reign forever and evil will once and for all be destroyed. Be, excuse me, judged, not destroyed, judged. Because the judgment will not be an annihilation. The judgment will be eternal um, damnation in hell. And there is a difference, by the way. So let's take that to heart, friends. And just as Peter and John were very careful that whatever God did so powerfully through them, it was always directing people to, they were always using that to direct people's attention to Christ. Let us do the same, whether that be in our own individual life or in the life of his church. Well, Mother's Day is upon us. It's Mother's Day weekend. We want to celebrate a, a beautiful creation of God that God would have put into the heart of woman such an innate desire to you know, have children, uh, to, to raise those children, to nurture those children. And the, in the beautiful covenant of marriage, man, it takes two, folks. It takes a husband, it takes a father, it takes a mother, and together by God's design to raise those children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And so for this weekend, let's celebrate our mothers. If you still have your mother, try your best to get there and, and, and show your appreciation. If you don't, praise God that you did have her for the season you did and recognize and reflect on the ways that she's influenced your life. Well, Sunday's coming, and coming with that is a celebration of Jesus. But every day, frankly, is a celebration of Jesus. So let's keep with the challenge. Add three, days, add three minutes a day to your personal worship. And, you know, I gave that challenge for the year, but hey, let's not worry about that. Maybe every month you're adding three extra minutes to your personal worship. Great. Keep it up. Adding $3 to general fund giving. $3 a month to general fund giving. To giving to the second mile. To giving to uh, 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 Mission 365. Seeing God bless those gifts. I think it was $3 a week, actually. And then ultimately, engaging three unbelievers, first of all, in prayer for their souls, and then for God to open up opportunities for you to share the gospel with them. Those three challenges will bring a dynamic, life-changing impact into our community. Well, I love you, friends. I'm looking forward to our day of celebration coming this Sunday. And until we're together again, live sent.